Today we're going to divide ourselves into three groups. Don't worry, you don't need to actually move. I know how churches work. This split merely involves internal introspection and a bit of imagination. Now, depending upon your answer to the following question, you will either be in group one or group two. Think you can handle that? Okay. Are you a strict abide by the rules person where everything is black and white, there's right, there's wrong, it's that simple person? Or are you a person who thinks that rules are made to be broken, you see the world in shades of gray, and you see people as complex, you see life as an ever-changing, labyrinthine adventure? Don't answer it out loud. Okay. Keep this in your mind. If you are the rules type person, you are in group one. If you see the world as shades of gray and people's complex, etc., etc., you are group two. Again, don't answer out loud. Okay. As you keep your self-assigned groups in mind, let yourself imagine that you are standing with Jesus on the day the Sadducees came to him and asked the question about a man marrying his brother's childless widow. That man dies, leaving her still childless, and so on and so on until she's worked her way through all seven brothers now, I'm thinking hemlock, arsenic, she's obviously a black widow. Sorry, back to the point of the story. <laughs> this is where group one, our adhere to the rules people come in. Group one, you will be playing the role of the Sadducees. You are people of profound faith. Like the Pharisees and the Essenes, you are a Jewish religious and political movement. But you only recognize the five books of Moses as authoritative scripture. That's the first five books of what we call, the rest of us call the Bible. Furthermore, you don't believe in the resurrection. So group one, it's your responsibility to discredit this man, Jesus. He is leading your people, good Jewish people, astray. You need to prove to the crowds that follow him that his words are false. Okay? This is an important job. You figure out that you can trap him by showing that the doctrine of the resurrection is absurd and unworkable. So you take the concept of a leveret marriage wherein a childless widow marries her brother-in-law so that he can give her children in her dead husband's name, but you're going to stretch it to an unlikely scenario just to see what Jesus can do with it. Okay, let's move on. If you're wondering why I'd previously said you'd be divided into three groups, but I only created groups one and two, good listening. This is where our next split comes in. Group two are flexible, go with the flow people. You're going to be split into subcategories A and B. Group two A is comprised of all who self-identify as female. You'll play the role of a young childless widow standing in that crowd, listening intently as the Sadducees pose this question to Jesus. Across the way, you see your brother-in-law. Even though your husband has only been gone a short while, you know the two of you should marry. It's the way of things. Your mother has already questioned you about it. And your brother-in-law, he's come calling, awkwardly bringing gifts of meat and grain. 
He even brought you a young goat yesterday. But how could you look at him as a husband? You, you'd cleaned his bloody noses when he was younger. He was only 13 when you and your husband married. You'd, you'd coached him on how to talk to girls. You, you shudder a bit and you lean forward waiting anxiously to know what Jesus will say. Surely he will have a better answer for these Sadducees than you are imagining right now. Now we come to group 2B. Those who self-identify as male, you, my fine folks, are the young brother-in-law. You are agonizing over what is to come. You love your sister-in-law. Of course you do. She's always been so kind to you. She's been the best sister anyone could ever hope to have. But that's just it. She's been your sister. Your mind is in turmoil. You know you have to be responsible, but you feel your own dreams dying. Should you marry your brother's wife and the two of you have children, they're technically his children, not your own. And your inheritance diminishes with each child born. And now you're wondering, will you still be married in the afterlife? Will all of you still be married? The thought makes your heart sink into your gut. We know that the purpose of this story is to show that the Sadducees were trying to discredit Jesus, but I'm hoping by now that each person in this room feels at least some investment in all of this. Because when Jesus talked to people, it was about more than a test or a hypothetical situation. He was talking about real people's real life issues. And let's be honest, widows and orphans have historically been vulnerable. So this leveret marriage tradition wasn't a bad contingency plan to ensure that childless widows would be protected. Still, the idea of passing a woman from brother to brother as if she's a piece of property, seemingly using her as a brood mare is more than a little bit nauseating. So listen up, group 2A, you widows. You don't want to marry your brother-in-law? Just say no. It's as simple as, I saw that back there. <laughs> These ladies back here are practicing. It's as simple as spitting in his face and throwing his shoe. Okay, practice that. Okay, maybe it's not quite that simple. You see, there's a ceremony called a chalitza. Did I say that right? I'm, ask, I'm asking you, Robbie. Okay, good. The way she said it. It's performed in front of the town elders. The potential bridegroom has washed his right foot, He's wearing a special sandal, and he's walked four cubits. That's known as two yards. The chief judge reads the following words, which the widow repeats. My brother-in-law refuses to raise unto his brother a name in Israel. He will not marry me. It's basically a public shaming of the brother-in-law meant to force him to live up to his responsibilities towards her. But should the brother-in-law, that means you, group 2B, be, not be persuaded to marry your brother's widow and father children on your brother's behalf, this is when you will say, I do not wish to take her. Then your sister-in-law will remove your special shoe and throw it past the elders, past the onlookers, as far as she can. Now, widows... The next part may be up to you to decide, as my sources seem to differ, and Robbie, you may know the truth of this. You either spit on the floor in front of your brother-in-law or you spit in his face. 
It may depend on how you're feeling about him at the moment. A few more words are spoken by the presiding judge and by the widow. The brother-in-law returns the shoe to the court so that the le next lucky fellow can use it. Then after all is said and done, the judges declare that God's will has been done and the woman is free. Bada bing, bada boom, done. So again, why did Luke record this story? If everyone knows it's just another test for Jesus and he's going to pass it, why bother? Because it's more than that. As Jesus answers, he lets them know that while we may be caught up in the traditions and duties and expectations of this life, once we go to the next life, whatever that may be, we are free of all these earthly expectations. The expectations that society and family and friends and everyone around us place on us, that hypothetical widow, try that again, that hypothetical widow is now free. When she enters the time of the resurrection, she's no one's wife, she's no one's property, she is simply herself, a beautiful child of God. That's the good news for all of us. If you are a person who feels as if your way of life, your way of being is being threatened, your truths are being challenged. Or if you are a person who finds yourself stuck in undesirable situations with other people's expectations and demands guiding your daily activities and even your significant life decisions, know this. Jesus is reminding each of us, just as Jesus reminded the Sadducees and everyone else who gathered around him that day, that the resurrection had already begun. We are walking into it, working into it, moment by moment, walking into God's way of being. And God is offering more to us than rules and expectations that humankind may have placed on us. Whether you are a group one or a group two or a group of your own configuration, God is guiding you into a way of grace and hope, goodness and love. God is asking you to embrace the fullness of who you are, who you were created to be, God's own child, full of creativity and joy, able to walk into this new life, full of resurrection, fully embracing God's way of being. Are you ready 